Um, so I'll present our last scenario is um, the, the, the question is, what is your dream scenario of Asian American cultural production? So let me say that again. What is your dream scenario of Asian American cultural production in five to 10 years? Or what is your dream project in the next five to 10 years? And um, this one, we're gonna start with Ben. Oh, that's easy. I wanna take my band to Japan for a tour with my project Voyages. Um, uh, I mean, I would love that, that show that I did that I mentioned soft power really kind of, um, it really kind of brought home how there's still so few times that you would see Asian Americans on stage. I mean, this was such a, an anomaly of a production where everybody uh, was Asian American, but um, I just don't think people are comfortable yet uh, seeing a, an Asian American on stage or on screen or or uh, even in jazz. I mean, that's, although it's certainly changed a lot in the last few years, um, but it was a wonderful experience because uh, it, it just felt normal. You know, for even for me, I mean, to 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 be in a a band full of Asians feels weird because <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But this was uh, it it was a um, uh, it was just such a uh, paradigm shift. You know, to to be in that production, and I would love to see um, people take risks on the production side more. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen where uh, an Asian American can walk on stage and not be, oh, that's an Ama Asian American. That's the role that you play, right? Rather than just being a character, another character in a, in a, either a dramatic production or uh, even, even uh, on stage in, in a band, but although, um, although that is changing, but, but uh, like Zane said, you do get the, the occasional um, call for something where you're cl clearly, you've been uh, profiled as, as an Asian American to fit into a particular slot in some production, whether it's music or, or theater or film. And, uh, and it never feels good. <laughs> Even if it feels like, okay, I've been given an opportunity, it, it's an opportunity that was given to you because of the way you look. And we, I mean, we've been talking about this for so many years now that it, it seems silly to even bring it up again, but that's the dream scenario. But I don't think it'll happen in five to 10 years. <laughs> So um, what I would love to see in the next five to 10 years is I would love to see more Asian American music educators out there, um, especially in orchestra. I feel like so many of our students are Asian American, um, like so, so many, uh, but there aren't very many of us Asian American teachers out there. And um, and I know there have been students I've had in the past, you know, they've expressed, you know, I want to do music education. I want to be a music teacher, but I just, I feel like they, they feel like they can't because their family expects them to be something, something more than a teacher. Um, I think there's maybe a stigma in the Asian community that, you know, you're expected to be a doctor or a lawyer or a pharmacist or an engineer. Um, and so, you know, they want to do music, but they, they don't think that's an option. And I feel like that's so sad because like, they can make such a big impact on the future. Um, 
like that student that I was talking about, her parents wouldn't even let her be an orchestra. And, um, and, you know, having more of us out there to relate to our students and be voices for our students, that would be such an awesome thing to be able to do. Um, so I think, you know, I would just love to see more, more uh, Asian American music educators out there because they can make, you know, the world of difference for the future. That's great. Um, uh, I have actually kind of an, um, maybe a sort of uh, sideways, like, um, fantasy for the, the future um, in, in my professional world, which is, even though, you know, this is a panel, we're talking about Asian American um, issues and history in our own personal family histories of migration and, and things that are very specific to Asians and Asian Americans. Um, I feel like the field that I work in where I'm sort of the popular music specialist in a more traditional music department that has, you know, been set up really to teach um, Western classical music and doesn't always um, extend the same opportunities to students or to teachers who are interested in other um, forms of music. Uh, I'd really like to, you know, I feel like I'm sort of a, a non-traditional, I, I, I didn't come in the normal way. I'd not, um, a lot of my colleagues who are musicologists started off as performers and then sort of transitioned into becoming historians. Um, I sort of snuck in through the side entrance and, um, you know, work in a music department, but I'm not, my primary interest isn't in the sort of classical tradition. Um, and so I would really like to be able to create more opportunities uh, to, for, for really talented musicians and teachers to work with students and to have the opportunity to teach at the college level, even if they don't have um, sort of the, the classical music pedigree or the, the right, you know, terminal degrees. Um, I feel like there are a lot of really talented, um, you know, musicians in, our, in the communities that I work in and around um, who, who I think our students would get a lot of, um, uh, would get a lot from or learn a lot from if they were able to interact more with, with different kinds of music and different kinds of teachers. Um, and, and, and I think along with that also we're talking about in, in something like hip hop, um, getting more uh, African American, um, Latino, and also Asian American or, or other folks who are, you know, hip practitioners of hip hop, um, the opportunity to, to um, get to teach and work with students. And, and so I'd really like to see one of my, my, one of my professional goals is to try to open up th those kinds of opportunities um, at, at George Washington. Um, I think one, I think dream possibility kind of a little bit to, to what Benjamin was saying would be for this very formed in diaspora kind of art and music to make its way back. So to do a big tour in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh would be phenomenal. Even better would be for some of these songs that are very Bollywood inspired to land up in a Bollywood movie. Um, there's really no exposure like a Bollywood movie, in case anybody's wondering. Um, I'd also love to go to the rest of Asia with, with this project. Um, I have a friend who was actually gonna do a big tour of like all the major cities in China um, this spring for the first time. And it was like quite well paid and quite well funded and taken care of in a way that I don't think he's been extended similar opportunities in the US. Um, but I think with China's growth and with China's, you know, connections to the world and it's like really like rapid cultural growth too, um, there's like a hunger for things that you might not traditionally associate with China, with folks in China. Um, so to be able to go to those places with this work, I think would be really wonderful to have that full circle come around. Um, and then secondly, I was wondering if Lauren was gonna bring this up. I'm, I'm sure he's, you're familiar with 88 Rising which is like this kind of like this, you know, this big conglomerate of um, primarily East Asian uh, folks who are making these really big glossy hip hop pop productions that are like focused on East Asians and focused on like bringing the music to the East Asian countries as well. Um, I think zooming out something like that 
to other Asian American communities would be wonderful. I think also zooming out beyond hip hop and pop, if that's possible within the model, would be really wonderful. Um, but maybe I'm just like dreaming too big now. All these things I just named probably are not gonna happen within five to 10 years. So if you give me one of them, I'll be really happy. Oh, I don't think you should limit yourself, right? Um, thank you all for answering those. And we have a few minutes and I wondered if there was anything anyone wanted to bring up about any of the questions. You know, we have our dream scenario. We have our, you know, how we, we heard about how you um, position yourself at this, in this conversation, at least. I know that, um, you know, being aware of being Asian American can, can, I don't know how to say it. It's like that, it's just a very academic, academic word, but it's a very liminal space, right? You, you pass in and out of acknowledging it, maybe self-consciously or consciously. Um, we've talked about your family's migration story. Um, you know, I just wanted to open it up. Um, if you all have any thoughts or questions for each other, um, I'll leave it at that for a second. Well, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start with something. Um, I was really struck by the story that Amanda told um, about the girl and her orchestra. Um, I feel like I one of the one of the other ways in which race becomes salient in my professional world is Asian American students do sometimes seek me out um, as a you know a potential mentor or somebody who might understand what it is they're going through, and I definitely do hear from some students about. Um, you know, how music is something their parents don't want them to do, or that sort of stereotype of, you know, all Asian parents, you know, want their kids to be doctors or lawyers or, or do something. Um, you know, it's, it's really bigger than an Asian American thing. It's kind of, a, I think a lot of it has to do with immigrant parents and a sense of, you know, wanting to really um, have a secure future for their children and what they imagine that to look like. And, and the life of a musician isn't, isn't one of those things. And so, the thing that I'm interested in hearing other panelists here talk about is how much of that, you know, stereotype of the, um, you know, the Asian American overachieving, um, you know, pianist or cellist or, or sort of that, that is something that you, I mean, how do you relate to that stereotype? Because um, I hear that a lot, but it's not an experience that I personally have. I wasn't, you know, forced into, you know, rigorous piano lessons or, or something as a child. But, but again, I, I, um, it's something that I, I know is out there. And so I was just curious of whether that, that sort of archetype is something, like what, what is everyone's relationship, you know, to that? Is it something that you feel like you embodied at some point and then had to, had to learn how to deal with? Or is it something that you, like your experiences were, were far from what people might imagine the stereotypical Asian American musician to, to be. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, uh, <clears throat> I was going to say that uh, I, I didn't have that. I, my parents were very supportive about whatever that uh, me and my two siblings were going to go into. Uh, it was very non-Asian, our household. But I can tell you that my, my grandfather, and my grandmother were very, uh, uh, like Amanda was saying, very um, strict about uh, the upbringing of their of their kids, and and a lot of it had to do with, uh, especially the the two boys, uh, my my father and and his brother, were uh, seemed like under the gun a lot <laughs> to succeed. And uh, one example is um, they were both uh, voracious tennis, tennis players and they could not be allowed to fail <laughs> in any kind of tournament whatsoever. And I think it kind of, it, it kind of backfired on them in a way. They both married uh, Caucasian women. <laughs> they both split and from the West Coast and my father went to Europe and met a European and uh, my uncle joined the Air Force <laughs> and became a colonel. 
So um, uh, I, I don't, I th it kind of filters down a little bit in that uh, I hear these stories about what, um, what a, I guess a typical uh, first generation American, Asian American family was like. And I think that probably went a long way to fostering uh, or at least allowing uh, the love of music to foster in my life. And um, so I get it, I guess, uh, from a, a third generation or a generation removed from that anyway. Sorry to jump in. <laughs> um, being a first American, or sorry, first generation um, kid, like, I, I mean, I do understand why Asian parents want their, you know, kids to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, um, just because I know that they grew up with a really hard life and they immigrated to America to, to have a better life for their children. And I think, you know, to make sure that they do that, they, they wanna encourage their children to, to do something where they can make a good living and um, not have to be worried about money all the time and not, um, just not have that fear of, you know, what am I going to do if I don't have anything? And, um, you know, our parents, they, when they came here, they, they didn't speak English. They didn't speak the language. I can't imagine how um, isolated they must have felt, how alone that they must have felt. Um, so, I mean, I do understand to a certain extent, you know, why Asian parents are so particular about what their children want to do. Um, but I think bringing awareness to, um, to what we do and, um, having gone through that myself and being able to, you know, talk to my students, I hope, you know, the generations later, um, you know, they'll, they'll get more of a, you know, a choice of what they want to do and be free to, choose what they want to do. So I, that's, that's my hope. So we have maybe time for one more comment or thought. Um, something, oh, and we have Eric back who might be jumping in. Yes, I, I want to follow up uh, on what Jen said earlier about the, the pull and push thing with, with your identity. Can we talk a bit about that as well? You might have to pick one. Call one out. Uh, Zane, you didn't talk about the last one, so I'll, I'll ask you. <laughs> Yes, that I, I was gonna say, I think the push and pull idea is like, that's an interesting question for me. Sometimes actually when I think about it in a, like a very sonic sense. So if you've listened to my music, you know, um, I often include the sound of stars, of santurs, of tablas, of gunguru bells. And um, I think there's often moments both when people are listening to the songs as well as when I'm conceptualizing the songs where there's a bit of a pull away from it sometimes where I start to feel like the usage of these sounds is automatically marking off the territory with, within which this music exists. And that territory is, is it's entirely glued to my identity and is there for that reason. And when it feels that way, then I really start to not push into that into into these things I've learned and I've grown up with and imbibed my whole life, but I really try to pull away from it because it all of a sudden it starts to feel like again that box is being put onto this song or the way that this song either others are hearing it who I'm get, get, gathering feedback from, but also sometimes from me. Um, I think whenever this question of fusion music 
comes up. Um, I think for the most part, people generally have pretty bad connotations of like what fusion means. And I think it like kind of perfectly encompasses like some of the tensions we feel if you bring up this push and pull dynamic, which is that, again, I'm trying to put a bunch of things into this soup, but I don't want it to taste like fusion. That's like not what I'm going for. I'm going for something that like really feels like those all things, those things all belong there in the very first place. They could have been there the whole time. It just took somebody to find that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a strange, ever evolving, like relationship. I think for me, in terms of again the family of sounds that I that I relate to and that I draw upon in my music. I'm I'm gonna ask more pointedly Amanda about when you program Asian American composers as opposed to the typical canon of youth orchestra. What is the what do you choose and how do you find the response to it? Generally, I recognize that, you know, it can be, it can vary widely. Um, so when I look for um, that music, uh, w there are a couple of Asian composers um, who write educational tunes and stuff and, and they're quite good and they don't always you know, sound Asian or whatever, but um, but it's it's good that we have a few out there that we can choose from. I mean, it is still very limited, um, and so we we do try to play one Asian piece per concert, but that doesn't always happen. We do, you know, probably like seventy five percent of the year, um, and then some other times I just think of um, like the last concert that I did. Do you guys know who um, Teresa, Teresa Tung Sung is? She was like a really, um, really popular singer back in the 60s or 70s um, in China. And, and I told my kids, she was like the Britney Spears of the time back then. And, um, and my parents were kind of talking about her and then I kind of started listening to her, her songs and I was like, I bet I can find an orchestra version of this and we're going to play it. And so I, I typed it into YouTube and I, I, I saw an orchestra playing her, one of her pieces and it's um, the one about the moon. It's like her most popular one. I can't think of it right now, um, but and then I was trying to figure out who made this arrangement and it was a long shot, but I just emailed the information that was on the YouTube thing and it was an orchestra in Taiwan who was playing it. And, and they answered me back, which I was surprised of. And they said that their conductor had arranged that piece and, um, and he was willing to um, sell it to us. So, so we bought it and, the youth orchestra played it and it was it was a hit at the concert because I think all the parents could relate to it. That's really that's really interesting and I think that you know the idea about I'm interested I'm on I'm looking at biographical essays for Mark and you know would love to know your thoughts. I I often think of orchestra music as if you could actually reach the youth orchestra people those composers would carry on, right? Like my son's still playing Offenbach, right? He's playing, <laughs> and I'm not sure, like, you know, do we need to perpetuate that? Or maybe we can find some other, you know, really interesting music that can be, you know, can, can go on from that level. So anyway, sorry for my personal agenda there. Um, it is 6.30 my time, it is 9.30 your time, and I think I should wrap this up. Um, I would love to, um, talk with you all some more, have sort of this very formal, you know, <laughs> formal casual thing. Um, and thank you for coming and participating and contributing your voices to um, Mark's, um, Mark's virtual story circle. And don't forget to come back next week. <laughs>